Hello and welcome back to section six of our motivation part. So keep in mind that the motivation part is meant as a round trip to sneak into certain areas of, of the course. And now we actually look a bit under the hood. How is actually the engine of our ASP system working? As you heard in the last section on the workflow, it, ASP solvers are composed of two parts, a grounder, Gringo the grounder in our case, and Clasp the solver. And I will now uh, give you a little overview of how Clasp the solver works. So here's the architecture of Clasp. I hope that this doesn't frighten you too much. The first thing in the heading to note actually is that Clasp is multi-threaded. So you can run in shared memory several uh, copies of Clasp in parallel. And in, in fact, then you have options, right? You can take the search space and distribute it or different parts of the problem to different, uh, different machines or different cores or have the same problem running on different cores in parallel with different strategies. Now let's follow a little bit the workflow. Now we start with a logic program here at the, at the bottom. Oops, this was the wrong direction. So, and then this logic program is fed in uh, the solver. So keep in mind that it, it, comes out of the, it comes out of the grounder. It is propositional. There are no variables, no, no variables for objects anymore. It is fed into the solver, then the program builder starts and creates a data structure. And then a couple of pre-processing steps are happening. And even though you can configure them via the command line, in principle, there are two different pre-processing steps. The first pre-processing steps work on the logic program and do simplifications that work under the stable model semantics. Then the logic program gets translated into so-called no goods, which are Boolean constraints, or you can also see this as clauses which express that certain propositions cannot be true together. And then we actually borrow techniques from preprocessing and satisfiability testing, and of course have to adapt them to the semantic setting that we have here. Keep in mind, satisfiability testing, one works under the open world assumption, and stable model semantics that we do here under the closed world assumption. And of course, there we have to take uh, care that we do not simplify things away that work under one, one semantics, but not the other. Okay, once things are uh, pre-processed, they enter the data structures and in a multi-threaded uh, uh, context or setting, we have a shared context here, which holds data structures for all different um, solver instances. So foremost, this here is, a, is, a, is an abbreviation for the dependency graph. So how, where do atoms occur, in which bodies, and uh, then you have propositional variables for the atoms, but also for the bodies. Uh, and this gives you a data structure with which you, you can then work. And what you also store here are actually short no-goods, short Boolean constraints of size 2 and 3. Where that are held globally and not it, uh, it, at each solver. Now, as Clasp is multi threaded, you can have one to actually 64 uh, Clasp instances running in parallel. But, well, using 64 just causes memory congest congestion, at least on the machines we are using on a daily basis. In fact, the architecture and the algorithms of each solver instance follow the conflict-driven constraint learning scheme that has been driven to perfection in the area of satisfiability testing, but whose ideas go back to work in the 70s actually by Richard Stallman on uh, intelligent backtracking. Anyway, the idea is more or less to really base the whole thing on the quest for conflicts and then to learn from mistakes. So the idea is you go in the search space, you look for a conflict. Once you found one, you analyze this conflict. You take your time. You don't just backtrack. No, you take your time. You analyze it. And then you find out two things. First of all, a representation of the conflict. And second, this representation tells you where you made your mistakes. So you're not just going up the search tree and continue. But no, you jump back. You do back jumping to the place where the error occurred, and then you add this new piece of information that was implicit before to your problem description, and you continue, but now with new information under your arm. And so this is more or less the idea of, 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 of the solvers. And then again, if they, these guys are col collaborating, there is a global uh, data structure here, the shared no-goods, where things are, are, are kept. 
but this is perhaps not so interesting right now. One thing that is interesting is the enumerator over here, because this is a bit particular to ASP solvers. The enumerator more or less tells the solver what to do next after it found a solution or after it detected unsatisfiability. So think of optimization, right? So the solver found a solution, it has a certain value, and now the enumerator says, ah, you're optimizing. Go back, look for a solution that is better. And there are other applications for that. Okay, so let's, let's stop here on the, on the architecture and um, just look at a little, little bit of the picture. One thing I have to say that this work, again, owes so much to, to just having brilliant people in the group and, and uh, the design of Classroom and the implementation are due to Benjamin Kaufmann, who actually received the best European dissertation award for this a couple of years back. Anyway, so just to, 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 to honor actually his work, so let's go, go back and look at the next section. Bye.